Hello, friends. It's weekend, and we are back again with our second edition of our JIX Rapid Journal Review. We know that the debate between liberal versus conservative fluid strategy for septic patients have been going on for long. And it was not long ago that the classic trial was published. But followed by classic, there was yet another publication, the Clovers, that is crystalloid liberal or vasopressor early resuscitation in sepsis, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in the month of January this year. So whatever may be the results and whatever we will come to it later, but first things first, first we have Dr. Pradeep Rangappa presenting this Clover's trial. So friends, so today I'll be talking about this journal, Clover's trial. So this was published in NEJM in 21st Jan 2023. So it's a very important uh, trial. So although if you read on the face of it, um, so it is pretty much the knowledge that we are aware of, but we just need to look at all the background work that has happened as to how we look at this particular trial. So the trial is uh, referenced as early restrictive or liberal fluid management for sepsis induced hypotension. So published on 21st Jan 2023. So the backdrop of this is what we have understood at this point of time in intensive care is too much of fluid even in the early part is found to be detrimental. So this is the backdrop against which these trials are being done to see if initial fluid resuscitation should be less and whether it has a bearing on the survival. So the backdrop is there is, there is this meta-analysis which came in 2017 conservative fluid management or de-resuscitation for patients with sepsis. So this we are looking only in patients with sepsis with hypotension. So this was the biggest meta-analysis of 11 randomized controlled trials, 2051 patients. If you see in patients where there was a conservative fluids as compared to liberal, the ventilator free days was increased, which is good. And ICU length of stay was less. So compared to liberal, where conservative fluid group was there or where patients were de-resuscitated to keep them restrictive had better outcomes as per this meta-analysis. So that was one of the study. So the conclusions they made in this was in patients with sepsis and ARDS, conservative fluid resuscitation or de-resuscitation led to better outcome with increase in ventilator free days and reduced in ICU length of stay. So this is the forest plot of, as you see, the diamond is towards the left, favors conservative. And this is the ICU length of stay. As you see, the P is significant and it favors the conservative fluid resuscitation. So then we need to look at other data, other subgroup analysis that have happened. If you look at this, this is a vast data, fluid resuscitation in septic stroke. Again, where it shows a positive fluid balance are associated with increased mortality. So in the vast data, in the subgroup analysis of septic shock patients, positive fluid balance at day four was found to have direct correlation with increase in the mortality and the optimal survival happened if at the end of 12 hours, positive fluid balance was around three liters or less. So which means to say at the end of four days, if you have too much of fluid positive balance, initial resuscitation is fine, but having positive fluid balance which is uh, extending to four days definitely had a bearing on mortality then there was this soap investigator so these are all uh, landmark trials as you would know even this soap investigate soap study when they did subgroup analysis they found that positive fluid balance had increased in the 60 day mortality and uh, early initiation of rrt outcome was found to be better in this septic group so this was the French group. So this is the some, some background we have. Then later on, this was a large observation uh, cohort study, which came from Germany, 730 ICUs in 84 countries. They looked at 1,808 sepsis patients. So this is mainly observational study. So where they saw that the cumulative fluid balance was uh, similar between survivors, but day three fluid balance if it was negative was associated with survival as compared to day three fluid balance, which if it was positive, it had a correlation with non-survival. So all these studies basically said 
at the end of day three to day four it is not good to have too much of positive fluid balance so what this basically means is initial fluid resuscitation is fine but we cannot keep on increasing the initial fluid resuscitation we need to keep a tab on the cumulative amount of fluid because if the cumulative amount of fluid keeps going up up to day three to day four then it did have a bearing and this came from vast data it did come from soap study and it did come from multiple observational studies so then after this we started getting these trials so it was a refreshed trial so restricted fluid in a pilot randomized control trial in an australia where this was a randomized control trial it's a small study which came from australia 99 so they had 15 restrictive group and 49 in usual group and as you see the 90 day mortality was no different between the restrictive and usual care and the duration of vasopressor usage in restrictive as you see uh, statistically there was no difference between restrictive and the usual care so basically it was a neutral study we said either you do restrictive or usual it did not have any bearing on 90 day mortality or duration of vasopressors and here the amount of fluid used in restrictive group is 32 to 39 ml per case so very small amount i'll show you how it has unfolded over years then came this rips trial this came in 2019 which is restrictive iv fluid trial in severe sepsis and septic shock this was a randomized pilot study which came from us so very similar to the refresh trial refresh trial came in 18 by australian this came in 2019 this was a randomized control trial done in two hospitals between November 16 to February 2018. Very similar to refresh trial, 109 patients, refresh trial had 99. So 55 in restrictive group and 54 in the usual group. 30 day mortality, as you see, there's no difference between restrictive and usual. But the duration of mechanical ventilation in this rich trial was significantly less where restrictive fluids was used. And when they looked at other outcome variables like new organ failure, serious adverse events, or IC or hospital length of stay, there's no difference between the restrictive and the usual group. So if you see the refresh trial, they used around uh, 32 to 39 ml per kg. Here in restrictive, they used 47.1 ml per kg. And in usual care, the amount of fluid that was totally used was 61.1 ml per kg. So this we need to compare with all the previous trials so this was found to be two to three fold less even if you take the usual care it was two to three folds less than the restrictive fluids used in other landmark studies like if you look compared to reverse where the the total amount of fluid that was used was 168 ml per kg this this was from us in 2001 process trial came in 2014 again from us here the restrictive group used 108 to 130 ml per kg but when you compare how from 2014 to 2019 we have mood is significant reduction even in the usual care so this is a restrictive care in process where 108 to 130 here in usual care you are using 61.1 ml promise trial which came in 2015 by uk 98 ml per kg and arise which came from australia used 108 to 109 ml per kg in restrictive so this is the sort of a transformation that has happened where even in the usual care currently in the randomized control trials the amount of fluid is much lesser than what has been used in certain landmark trials in 2014 and 15 so this is what you can gather so then came this sensor trial this was published in american journal of respiratory and critical care where they looked at early use of norepinephrine in septic shock and randomized trial so this came from the thai group but us authors also were involved this was a much larger study 310 patients they compared early norepinephrine usage was happened in 155 this is important because our clover trial which i'll be talking is similar to this and standard was 155 where they continued to give fluid until they became non-responsive and they, then they started norepinephrine so the median duration to start norepinephrine was 93 so the time taken to start which means they started early norepinephrine 93 minutes as opposed to 192 because here in standard they waited until they resuscitated completely if you see the shock control at six hours happened very early in, where early norepinephrine was used obviously standard they were giving fluids 
So shock control took a uh, much large, longer time and less number of patients had shock control in six hours. But when they looked at 28 day mortality, there was no difference between early norepinephrine standard. But when they looked at side effects, pandredema was more in standard group as compared to early 27.7 versus 14.4. And even arrhythmias were more in the standard group as compared to. So early norepinephrine here had favorable benefit in early shock control and less side effects of pulmonary edema and arrhythmia. So that was the, and the conclusions they made, so this was published in 2019, early norepinephrine improves shock control in six hours. So to substantiate this, there are two meta-analyses that came, which also showed that early norepinephrine has mortality benefit. So this was the most recent sensor randomized control trial. After this, now we are talking about Clover's trial. So this Clover's trial, it was a very large sort of a study, 60 hospitals in USA, where they compared restrictive fluid versus liberal fluid. So in the restrictive fluid group, so the norepinephrine was to be started early. They, they prioritized norepinephrine. In liberal fluid resuscitation, they prioritized fluid over norepinephrine. So vasopressors were prioritized in restrictive and in liberal fluids were prioritized and randomization happened within four hours once a patient was refractory to fluid resuscitation up to three liters one to three liters within four hours if they're refractory then they were randomized into the trial inclusion criteria is patients with sepsis with hypotension were the patients that were in included so the hypothesis that was generated for this study was that the 90 day all cause mortality will be lower in restrictive fluid resuscitation groups. It means in the group where you are restricting fluid, the hypothesis was that mortality will be less as compared to the liberal group. So the secondary outcome was they looked at ventilatory free days, vasopressor free days, RRT free days, which is the standard secondary outcome, ICU free days, and hospital free days. So these are the secondary outcomes. So the backdrop of this is the liberal fluid resuscitation has low quality of evidence and this is shown by these two studies. And there are at least three good observational studies which says restrictive fluid resuscitation is superior to liberal. So this is one study from Denmark and this is a fish study and this is from the UK study. These three studies are observational studies which have shown signals of restrictive fluid resuscitation to be superior to liberal. So whilst this Clover's trial came, classic trial came at the same time. So we need to, it is exactly very much similar for the prototype of the Clover's trial. So this came from the Scandinavian countries, Nordic countries, restriction of intravenous fluid in ICU patients with septic shock. This is a classic trial group. So here they look compared between restricted fluid and liberal fluid resuscitation. They looked at 90 day mortality, which is exactly what in Clover's they did, and there was no difference. So this is a large study, 1,554 patients, 770 in restrictive, 784 in standard. As you see, the median amount of fluid received in restrictive was 1,798, in standard it was more. But 90-day mortality, which is the hypothesis in Clovers, where you say restrictive fluid should have less mortality. In classic, it did not show any difference. 90-day mortality, there is no difference. Serious adverse events, there was no difference. And life support free days and hospital free days were similar between restrictive and standard. So classic trial basically said there's no difference. Either you restrict or liberal, there's no difference. So we'll again get back to our Clover's trial. So at, if you see the classic trial had 1,554 and exactly the same prototype of classic. Here they had 1,563 patients. In restrictive, they had 782, standard 781. So the median the median amount of fluid was less by 2134 ml in restrictive group as compared to the standard. So, which, which is expected because restrictive was liberal. And our vasopressors were initiated early, that was significant. And, and the duration of vasopressors that was needed was much higher in restrictive because obviously you started early, so the duration also will be higher. So, the the primary outcome which they looked at is the 90-day mortality, as you see, it was 14% in restrictive and 14.9% in standard. It was not statistically significant. So here you see the mortality is 42.3 and 42.1.
so what it indicates is possibly the uh, the patient sickness quotient was possibly much lesser in the clover trial so if you see here the mortality was higher so that is something what one should keep a note and if you look at all the baseline characteristics between the restrictive fluid group and liberal fluid group as you see none of them are uh, significantly different and they are all well matched but what is interesting to note which authors do mention in the limitations is the sofa score was considered to be much lesser in clover's trial so the authors do uh, submit in the discussion saying that possibly if the sofa score was high uh, we do not know the effect size would have been better or identifiable difference in the effect size could have been uh, made out is what uh, has been submitted by the authors and another important difference between the clover trial and the classic which are a similar prototype here 93.2 percent of the patients 90 to 93 came to emergency from emergency they were randomized but in classic trial 34 percent of the sepsis patients came from the wards and 23 percent came from operating theater so the type of patients were distinctly different in the clovers and classic because you saw the mortality was higher in the classic trial in clovers it was much lesser and the type of patients also were a little different so that is one thing we need to note and when we look at the median amount of fluid that was required over 24 hour in restrictive 1267 as compared to around half of it was needed in restrictive as compared to the liberal which was almost double and the vasopressor administration was definitely more because restrictive vasopressors are prioritized as you see 59 percent needed vasopressors as compared to the 7.2 and early initiation happened in restrictive obviously for obvious reason and duration of vasopressors also obviously was longer in restrictive and all this as you see was statistically significant and here these are all the outcome variables which i said as you see, if you look at the confidence intervals here, none of them are significant with regards to organ support free days, ventilatory support free days, RRT free days, or vasopressor free days. No difference between restrictive and liberal group. And you can see all the confidence interval, none of them are statistically significant. And then you can look at all the new intubation and the initiation of RRT. So as just you can look at the right hand corner all the confidence interval if you see so none of them are significant with any of the outcome variables one has looked into even if you look at serious adverse events there's no difference so and if they have looked at new onset atrial ventricular arrhythmias ards onset and death from any cause at any location so so none of them were statistically different or significantly different between restrictive and liberal so then they have looked at mortality stratifying various variables here they have stratified age and they have looked at the mortality whether there would be any identifiable difference with age so this is a subgroup uh, stratification between the restrictive and liberal group as you see difference in mortality so when they compared the sex, there was no difference. Age-wise, there's no difference. And uh, any comorbids, they have looked at whether in any subgroup, whether restrictive and uh, liberal had any difference. As you see, just look at the right-hand corner. None of the confidence intervals are significant. So with mortality in subgroup stratification, there is no difference between restrictive. Having said that, authors do submit that one of the limitations is they have not looked at other subgroup analysis, which means here they have looked only at mortality stratifying for different uh, health conditions, but they have not looked at ventilatory free days, ICU length of stay, or vasopressor free days as a subgroup. They have not done subgroup analysis for that. Here they only stratified the mortality uh, sort of a difference in various subgroups. So this is one of the limitations they have. So here they have again looked at uh, whether there was any difference identifiable with different SOFA scores. Again, there was no difference. So basically, they have looked at stratification of various aspects based on comorbids, age, race, so forth, and there was no difference in mortality between restrictive or liberal in any of the subgroups. Okay. So the limitations of the study is some of the patients in the restrictive fluid, they found they had given more fluid. 
and some of the patients in liberal group they had given less fluid and as i said the subgroup analysis for other outcome variables was not the group analysis was done for mortality but like for ventilatory free days vasopressor free days length of stays there was no subgroup analysis or stratification done as it was done for mortality and the study was unblinded which means the investigators when they were assigning to the different groups restrictive or liberal so they were not blinded so there could have a potential bias that could have been infused and the another limitation is the protocol duration was only 24 hours so only 24 hours was the time when they had to do liberal and conservative so we do not know had we extended this period whether it had any bearing and the targets they had in both restrictive were very similar in a heterogeneous population that is considered as a uh, limitation and very surprising thing about this study is when they were giving fluid resuscitations in liberal and restrictive they did not use any advanced hemodynamic tools to assess fluid responsiveness which means ordinarily in this day and age we use echo at least as a they did not use echocardiogram they did not use any advanced hemodynamic tools to assess fluid response they used only clinical parameters so this is considered important limitations which was not the case in classic trial and again as i said so far was much lesser compared to classic trial so possibly greater effect could have been appreciated were the patients more sicker on the outcome so this is another limit so these are some of the limitations of this study so the conclusions of clover's trial is restricted fluid resuscitation had no significant bearing on reducing the 90 day mortality so and uh, one would one can look at it as did we really uh, so basically you can say either you give restricted or liberal it did not have any bearing on mortality but the, the reason why we mentioned about all the previous trials is we need to see whether are we really doing restrictive or liberal or it is or it is something that is acceptable compared to all the previous studies the type of fluids they used if you look at 2021 guideline recommendation 30 ml per kg is still recommended in septic shock within 3 hours of resuscitation and this has a weak and low quality sort of a recommendation and mean arterial pressure the recommendation in 2021 is septic shock vasopressors has to be used to maintain map more than 65 if they are not responsive to fluids this has a moderate uh, sort of a strength and quality of evidence so now summarizing this how we look at this clover trial our journey so far with regards to fluids we just reflect on how we have progressed from last 20 years for 60 kg individually to take reverse they used 168 ml per kg which means it amounts to 10 liters of fluids then in process trial which came in 2014 which debunked the early goal directed therapy they used 130 ml per kg in restrictive which is 7800 ml they used and in arise trial which came from australia in 2014 they used 109 ml per kg this is all restrictive groups where they used 6480 in promise the the number came down further to 98 ml per kg which is 5880 then came the rips trial from us which is 47 so you can see how over 20 years we are slowly reducing the amount of fluid that we are giving and we are calling it as restrictive so this is a paradox that one needs to appreciate we are calling it restrictive and we are constantly reducing the fluids and then came the refresh trial which is extremes where they used only 32 ml per kg which amounts to 1920 restrictive and classic trial which came from nordic in 2022 1798 ml so now clover trial which we are talking about the restrictive group at 1267 ml and liberal is 3000 so what you are calling liberal here is in fact restrictive from the promise from 2015 what you are calling restrictive is liberal here so this is the paradox which i want all trainees to appreciate how we are adopting more and more less fluids as a norm and we are for, and we are trying to segregate and differentiate within that less fluid as liberal and restrictive so this is a sort of a uh, dichotomous situation that one needs to appreciate how in last 20 years we are going more and more restrictive 
and what is considered liberal in clover's trial was in fact restrictive in promise trial and thereafter in rift's trial it was uh, you know so so what we is liberal is considered is restrictive in clover so this is something how we have progressed with fluids so there is more alignment towards adopting early vasopressors and trying to use less fluids and uh, we are, we clearly understand there are multiple studies which are really showing strong signals towards not having huge cumulative positive balance at the end of four days at, at, at four days one needs to have some sort of a net neutrality or negative balance so in a zeal to achieve that even initial resuscitation fluid should be restrictive so clover trial possibly it again put a question mark on early sepsis uh, uh, so surviving sepsis guidelines which still says 30 ml per kg because if you talk about 30 ml per kg up front you are giving 1800 ml so having said all this please bear in mind this is not an absolute value because all these trials before this number you are seeing they would have given 1 to 2 liters as a resuscitative fluid and after that this patients would have been randomized so you possibly have to add 1 to 2 liters to this as restrictive or liberal to make sense of it so that's about clover strain so thank you one and all so you can visit my website www.drpradeepranga.com to react to this lecture thank you pradeep so thank you one and all thank you thank you pradeep thank you very much for presenting this trial and now it's time for discussion we have with us Dr. Rajesh Shetty from Manipal Hospital, Bangalore. Welcome you, Rajesh. We will also be joined by Dr. Sumesh Arora. Probably he is missing the links with us. And of course, Pradeep will be joining again for the discussion part. First things first, as I said before, that this is one of the trials, a superiority trial, open level trial, which has found no difference between fluid and restrictive, between liberal and restrictive strategy. But once again, as Pradeep had pointed out, I, I want to start by asking Rajesh that, do you think do you think that once the patient has already received 2 liters of fluid before enrollment does that make the restrictive group really restrictive yeah you have to unmute yourself rajesh that's a very good question anirban uh, i think uh, that is one of the criticism of the study is that both the groups both the restrictive and liberal groups already had uh, 2 liters of fluid uh, so probably, you know, even though they uh, say that uh, there is a limitation of fluid, it may not be completely appropriate. And uh, if you look at uh, the patients we get, uh, especially in a uh, developing country like ours, uh, and working in a corporate hospital like my, me and uh, Pradeep and all that, most of the patients we get uh, wouldn't have had the luxury of, uh, you know, having this uh, two liters of fluid, and they would be much, much sicker as well. Uh, so probably, uh, you know, uh, absolutely, like, absolutely. Yeah, I fully, I fully regret that, Rajesh, that this, this is something, this is a reach in this trial that whether this, this prior fluid, whether they really, but one again, important thing, which comes that although this trial has shown that for the average septic patient, uh, it really doesn't matter whether you give a little bit of vasopressor more or a little bit of fluid more. But we all know that for uh, for some patients, it really makes so much of a difference you know, between vasopressors and because that's what we have been that in our observation in the clinical terms and even trials have also supported that. Now, the very important thing is that now when it comes to a certain, we need that sepsis is a very mix up of very common conditions. And we don't know which of these patients may have sepsis induced cardiac dysfunction or various other factors and how grave the areas. So do we need to redefine sepsis or select patients more 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 perfection with more perfection so that we can actually see the effect of vasopressors and uh, or the fluids yeah that's a very good uh, question uh, uh, anirban uh, in this study they have grouped uh, all uh, patients as septic and uh, the criteria they have used is anyone who has been an antibiotic or going to be going on antibiotic were considered as septic and they were put in one group that may not be very uh, uh, no, a good idea because uh, sepsis is not a homogeneous uh, disease it is a heterogeneous disease and as you said uh, those patients with septic cardiomyopathy may do badly with uh, excessive fluids compared to other uh, patients uh, who are more likely to be hypovolemic with a normal cardiac function having said that uh, you know uh, what uh, I wanted to say is that as Pradeep pointed it out very nicely, on, on the whole, we all of us are in agreement, I think, that excessive fluid is harmful. 
and our practice has changed. You know, over the course of 20 years, we are already giving less fluid compared to before. Now, question is, should we reduce it any further? Based on this uh, Clover study, you would uh, say that uh, probably uh, reducing it any further blindly without appropriate uh, patient assessment may not be a good idea. You know, it is uh, a very good, yeah, it's it's very correctly, it may not be a good idea, but it's a, it's a very good trial. It has a large number, but you have to remember that it has been stopped because of lack of, you know, for a futility. And yeah. also the important thing that how good is a blood pressure or a systolic blood pressure as a surrogate for the severity of sepsis, because that's on the basis of which you have done. And there is no volume assessment. Pradeep has also pointed out that there was no way of volume assessment while uh, determining. So I think that's also need to be looked upon. And if 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 not anything else, the, but there are some very strong positive messages too. And if whether you have noted or not, 27% of the patients who were administered vasopressors were administered through the peripheral line. And you know that 40, only 27% in that group, in the vasopressor group or the rest, I mean the restrictive group had a, had a peripheral line, 59% received vasopressors. Mm -hmm. And 40% of these patients received vasopressors for four, for four to six hours. Or, and 30% and received for the entire duration through the peripheral line. Now this nobody has pointed out, but I think that this is a very significant point which one can pick up from the study, which shows us how safe it is to use administered vasopressors through the peripheral line because there was not a single, it's, there was no incidence of extravasation or any, any complications. In fact, complications were there in the other group. This is, a way, this is a very good message for our trainees because if you wait for the center line to be inserted before you start uh, noradrenaline or any vasopressor for that matter, there will be a delay in treatment. So I think uh, th that is a very important message from this study is that uh, please don't delay. If a patient needs vasopressor, you can start uh, with peripheral line and it doesn't cause any increase in uh, you know, side effects. That is the main thing we are worried. You know, as a trainee, uh, we would have been crucified if we had started vasopressors through a peripheral line. But I see that uh, nowadays we have become a little more courageous. While we are putting the central line in, we would have started the, uh, the vasopressors through a peripheral line. And uh, that is a message I would like to give it to uh, the trainees that please do that. And this is a good, uh, you, know, uh, you have a backup from this study that it, it is not harmful. If, if results are to be believed, then there is absolutely no reason to wait for a central line to start the vasopressors. That's a one good point. And also the another very good point is that if we have a sick patient and in this sick patients are we off, often we know they are not shifted to the ICU when they are on fluids. It that uh, takes a lot of time or that kills sometimes. Mm, and ultimately, but when the patient is on vasopressors, they are definitely in most of the cases they are shifted to the ICUs. So, do you think that early or restrictive approach? has also an advantage that these patients get a better care in at some point earlier in comparison to the patients who are on liberal fluid approach uh, yes pradeep are you there you, you can also join us pradeep are uh, you I able would, to uh, you know i would say uh, yeah, yeah 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 i'm, I'm here and i sorry i was yeah yeah, yeah. continue rajesh as, rather yeah than, please rajesh uh, rather than saying restrictive or liberal I think uh, these are two vague terms, I would uh, say, you know, uh, we shouldn't uh, just uh, do restrictive just because we want to be restrictive. It has to be appropriate to the patient. Uh, what I would uh, say is that you have to do a dynamic uh, fluid responsiveness assessment and you see which patients need fluid and give flu fluids to those patients and not give fluid to those patients who are not, uh, uh, you know, fluid responsive, who already have enough uh, fluid in their system and uh, start uh, NORAD early. You know, because uh, even if the patient uh, is hypovolemic and fluid responsive and you have given fluid, it will take some time for the perfusion pressure to in increase. So what I would do is rather than saying I would be restrictive or, uh, you know, liberal, I would uh, give appropriate amount of fluid and I would use, uh, you know, dynamic uh, fluid uh, responsiveness to see which patients will benefit from fluids. In the meantime, I will start early uh, early vasopressors. Uh, in that way, I would say that whatever question asked in the Clover study is probably wrong, actually. You know, it has to be as per the patient's requirement rather than blindly saying that I am restrictive or I am liberal. So it is actually, we have seen, uh, Pradeep, that well, 20% of these patients were on vasopressors at the beginning and finally, which turned out to be 59%. Now, we all know that 
this liberal the one group received uh, rescue fluids and the other group received rescue vasopressors. Now, the quantum of effect of each of these has hardly differed. And therefore, it, within that confidence interval, the effect on mortality, we have found that it is varying from minus 4.4% to plus 2.6%. Although it is not significant, but it is flipping on either side of the coin. Now, my important study is that whether at this point of time, one needs to really think about that there is a need to redefine sepsis. Yes, Pradeep. Yeah, so Anirman, there are two strong messages that possibly comes out. See, I think all these fluid trials we are seeing, it is very clear that we are trying to have a, uh, try to find out a difference between a small uh, sort of a volume of uh, fluids that we are now giving. Because if you see how we have progressed, from 10 liters, we have come down to around 3 liters. I think even in this liberal, 3 liters was the thing. So the I think uh, this Clover's trial is a mute study. In fact, the classics trial was possibly a little more better study. So both of them answer one question, that we should not overzealously resuscitate to have cumulative fluid. So there are two aspects to this. One is... Obviously, we should restrict so that our cumulative fluid balance does not pile up. I think that is the whole message that tends to percolate in all of these studies that I have shown. So, uh, so with that effect, so it has to be a combination of fluids because I remember Rajesh would agree that uh, we were all overzealous with fluid resuscitation around a decade back. We were all very uh, resuscitating with large amount of fluid boluses. But that concept is slowly changed and now we believe that it has to be, as Rajesh said, it has to be appropriate based on the fluid responsiveness and the vasopressors to go in tandem. So overall, we should keep a tab on cumulative fluid balance because all the studies of time and again at this point of time are pointing out that huge cumulative positive balance is what is causing organ dysfunction. And now we have understood the concept of excess one and so forth. So that is where we are at. So, so, so that, 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 that way. That way, that way, Pradeep, yeah. cumulative flu fluid fluid balances only is has a greater risk when you approach through a liberal fluid strategy than restrictive yes. strategy. Yes. And so even yes. in that case, probably we can, if we have to err on the side of any of the two, it is better to err on the side of restrictive strategy than on the liberal strategy. Anirban, having said that, cumulative fluid load. Anirban, having said that, as Pradeep pointed out, even the liberal group is actually restrictive, you know, compared yes. to yes. the yes. Uh, so that has yes. to be taken into account. No, no, no. That, that There is an interesting question asked by Kiran. And it says that if we go ahead with resuscitation, how much would you preload with fluids? Would you start vasopressor simultaneously or sequentially as we practice taking into consideration? Well, uh, uh, something, something uh, sequential. So it, is it something that we need to be careful about at particular stages? Now, that is an interesting question. I should we can take that that when we consider preloading, we, we have to go with fluids because if the patient is volume depleted, there is no second thought that the perfusion can improve with fluids. But can vasopressors be started simultaneously or sequentially? That's a very interesting concept. I think we can think about it. Yes, you have any thought on that, Dr. Rajesh? I would uh, say that you know, if patient is uh, fluid depleted, and uh, volume responsive. Uh, initially, I would give, for example, you know, half a liter of fluid, depending on the patient's circumstances. And many of the time, you will say that if patient is hypotensive, this small fluid uh, bolus itself is enough to improve the, uh, you know, the blood pressure itself. In which case, I wouldn't, uh, you know, start vasopressors as such. But somebody, you have given up to 30 ml per kilo, you know. And uh, you see that blood pressure is very low and there is no incremental uh, improvement in blood pressure. Uh, there, I would start. Sequentially, it depends, you know, uh, what time point you are going to start. I would, wouldn't wait until the patient is completely fluid resuscitated. I would give initially small boluses of fluid and see how is the fluid responsiveness and see if there is improvement in blood pressure. If there is fluid responsiveness, but not much improvement in blood pressure, I would uh, start uh, the norepinephrine. Usually, that is my vasopressor of choice. I would start early. Yeah, yeah. Whatever say that a sequential ap approach would refer to a sudden increase in, uh, in the vasopressor dose. Then mm -hmm. see for the wait for the response. Then, uh, then start adding little bit of fluids if you see the patient is probably that makes you to cumbersome because once we know that the patient the, is volume is 
repleted, then there is no point adding further sequential. Only till the time the push patient is volume depleted, it would be useful to adopt such a sequential approach. But after the patient becomes volume repleted, there is actually basically no point. But mm -hmm. one important thing that all studies have, have, have identified diverse group of patients. But in this group of patients, if, if you watch Pradeep, they have a, a, a four hour window. They have a four hour window and a lot of things are actually happen beyond the four hours because whether it is how much pertinent, because that four hours time is, if, if you see in context of our country, so that four hours uh, may, may actually eliminate a lot of group of potentially eligible you know, patients. Mm. So what do you think, Pradeep? No, 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 absolutely. See, although they have said in the inclusion criteria Nirban that one to three liters is a refractory, but if you see whatever they have given as a, a resuscitative fluid, it has not been very high. So which means in four hours, you can only do that much, isn't it? So. Uh, so, so I think the four hours randomization, as you rightly said, would uh, sort of create a lot of exclusion criteria and uh, even optimization would not have been adequate. And the whole limitation of this study is this protocol is only for 24 hours, Anirban. So, which means whatever exercise you have done with your restrictive and liberal is confined to 24 hours. And ICU patients within 24 hours to conclusively say they've had a dramatic change because that's where the whole concept of mini fluid challenges, because it is a continuum of a disease where a lot of uh, turbulences happen during the course of ICU stay, where again, we may have to do repeat fluid responsiveness test, and, uh, some dynamic indices and do mini fluid challenges. So it is not like once you have resuscitated, everything is all right and patient is only on a trajectory of getting better. So there are going to be turbulences. There are going to be hypotensive episodes. And during those episodes, again, uh, tests for fluid responsiveness with dynamic indices has to be performed and mini fluid. That's where the concept of mini fluid bolus has come, where we only give 200 ml. So that's where we need to have advanced absolutely, hemodynamic absolutely. tools, which, need to which this study never had. So, which means all this has not been done in Clover Sanirban, which is a huge yes, limitation. Yes. So, given that we cannot take uh, much conclusions on that uh, aspect of Sanirban. Absolutely, absolutely. Fully agree with you. Uh, Rajesh, last words from you. We have already surpassed our time. Okay. And just two things I wanted to highlight about this study, even though it's a very good uh, study, uh, you know, both internal validity and external validity is uh, no, not uh, completely adequate. One of the concerns is, as Pradeep pointed out, early stoppage. You know, and uh, there are a, a lot of studies which have shown that, uh, you know, if you have assessed in the middle and you see that there is uh, no uh, you know, difference in outcome, and if you had uh, actually continued that study, you will see that at the end of the st study, actually there is a uh, outcome benefit. So there is a possibility that if this study was con uh, continued, uh, maybe the result would have been different. And also, you know, non-superiority, it's a superiority study. It doesn't mean that there is no superiority, there is no difference. You cannot uh, say that. It may, you may, you'll only say that because of the inadequate numbers, they were not able to show the difference. So I think question whether liberal and uh, restrictive, uh, is there any difference? I think uh, you still need to wait for uh, another study, which has a bigger number of patients and more sicker uh, patients. And maybe uh, select patients who are selected at an early phase, where even this two liters of fluid is not given. Uh, probably uh, that may answer the question. This uh, Clover study, I feel, has not been able to answer that question, what they set out. Anyways, for. Pradeep, in short, any any last message? Yeah, in, in short, Anirban, this Clover study really will not change because this, this ra rapid journal review is to see if it influences or practice change. No, the answer is no. It has no bearing on the fluid, which we have understood. I think they have tried to say, uh, you know, segregate between two numbers and try to see whether it's going to show any difference. So we have good signals to tell that uh, within that small amount of fluid, you toggle how much ever you want, you will not be able to appreciate difference. So basically keep an eye on the positive cumulative fluid balance, I think that becomes terribly important and trying to uh, delineate and uh, titrate between a small amount of fluid within 24 hours or 36 hours really not going to make any difference in the outcomes and multiple refresh study also endorses that, RIFS trial also endorses that. So we don't need more trials in that small amount of fluid to see if it's going to make any difference on it.
Friends, as you have heard, the CLOVERS trial also they have highlighted no difference on the mortality at 90 days with early in, in liberal versus restrictive fluid strategies as a finding which is almost similar to that of the classic trial. But yet it has also been merged with a lot of controversies because for the methodological flaws and still people believe as all the experts believe, the other people believe that we will continue to use vasopressors and we will continue to administer fluids depend incrementally depending upon the volume status of the patients. And as such, any such clear difference may not be evident, but there is always prefer to avoid this cumulative excess of cumulative fluid or rather to go for a for a, for a softer approach in, in, in against the liberal fluid administration. However, more trials will come up in the coming days, and I'm certain I'm sure that this is not the end of this debate or the discussion until the certain some other studies come up with some more interesting findings. We will again be back with some more interesting journal club article next week. Till then, from all of us from the Jigs desk, Shubhratri, Shavar Khayat, good night. Thank you, Anirban. Thank you, Pradeep. Thank, thank you, you thank you, Anirban. Thank you, Rajesh. Thank you, all the uh, panelists, sir. And thanks all the listeners who have joined. Thank you, one and all. Thank you, sir.